This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. So welcome to episode 147, and this week's guest, many people will have heard of, as he has been so active in making a difference in this industry for so long. And today we welcome Paul Merriman to the podcast. Paul's a financial ed- educator, author, public speaker. He founded the firm uh, that bears his name back in 1982. And a bit of a backstory. So I've, I've known of Paul for probably 25 years. We'd never met before. But as we kind of think of different guests that we could reach out to have on, on, on the podcast, I sent him an email probably six or nine months ago or so. I just sent it found an email online, sent it out. And within, I think, two or three minutes, my phone was ringing. He called me back because he's a phone guy, right? And he's got a very, very um, unique radio type voice. And I pick up the phone and sure enough, it's Paul Merriman. And what a nice, warm, kind guy. Like he was one of the people that shaped our business back in the 90s, you know, in the same kind of era of you know Larry Swedro, Mark Hebner, who was on recently, Jack Bogle as well. So these people really formed how how we built the practice back then. And I just couldn't believe I'm talking to Paul Merriman and right away he said, absolutely love to come on on, on the podcast. So we exchanged uh, emails and phone calls a number of times since then and he asked us to welcome him on after his most recent book was published, which it was this past December. So that's how Paul ended up on on the show. Yep. Pretty cool, and I'm sa- same as you, Cameron. He, he's one of the, he's one of the people who are out there. If you start researching index investing, Paul's stuff is out there. I mean, just like we're we're doing a podcast and publishing model portfolios and research and all that kind of stuff, he's been doing that for however that however long that is thirty years. And that first phone call, he says, "You work with Ben. I love his videos." And he said, "Can cool. we get Ben's videos embedded on our website?" Like, absolutely. Like, like they're out there. So he was well aware. Of, of what you've been up to and what we've been up to. So that, that was pretty cool. Anyways, he talks a lot about his background in, in the episodes. So it won't uh, belabor that too much. But it, it was an good. interesting conversation. But I say, yeah, let's just let it roll from here. Yeah, let's go. Paul Merriman, I must say, it's a great thrill to welcome you to the Rational Minder podcast. Well, I'll tell you, it is, I mean, I'm, I really mean this. It is a thrill to be here. I have been uh, so blown away by the work that you guys are doing at educating investors. I just, I just think it is a, it's a life changer. Sometimes you don't know that until you've been doing it for 30 years and you get emails from people saying, I've been following your work for 30 years and you've changed my life. You guys are changing lives. So thanks for inviting me. Well, I was one of those guys that has been following you for decades. So there's certainly inspiration from you that is coming through on the efforts that we're doing. Now, now, Paul, you've had an incredible career. There's no doubt about it. I'd like to kick off this interview with you describing your career. Well, uh, I don't, not all of it was really very incredible for what it's worth, Cameron. I um, started wanting to be in the industry, the brokerage industry, thought it would be really cool to become a stockbroker and get to meet really successful people. And uh, I started trying to get into some firm when I was 19 and still going to college, but thinking when I graduate, will you want me? And the answer was no. We want you to go out, we don't care what you sell, go out and sell something, even if it's Fuller Brush or whatever. And uh, at age 22, and I kept going back, by the way, and at age 22, when I was graduating, they called me and said, would you really like to come to work? I was thrilled, only to find out it was not anything like what I thought it was going to be. And so within three years, I was out of the industry. Uh, It is a great place to make money, but it comes with so many conflicts of interest that it just was difficult for me to accept that. So I did a whole bunch of things between then and when I was able to retire at age 40. I didn't know anything about the FIRE movement then, but that's what I became part of by default. Hmm. 
And so uh, after having run some small businesses and a small public company, I was able to cash in and have over a million dollars, which I still thought was a whole bunch of money, and uh, and start a whole new career for fun. It had nothing to do with making money. I started an investment advisory firm. My minimum size account was $2,000. If you had $2,000, I would work for you and charged them 1%. So I was yours for 20 bucks a year. Uh, so that was not a business model that would ever cut it. Um, and it wasn't until a bunch of people joined me that they demanded that I change my ways. But we built a real firm mm -hmm. and we built it on teaching people how to do it themselves. It's not so different from what you guys are doing. And the reality is most people don't want to do it. And so we were there to do it for them. And, and we thought we charged a, a fair price. You guys certainly do. And, uh, and that, was, that was the beginning. And the end was I sold it in 2012. We had 1.6 billion under management. And uh, uh, I, I took some of the money I got from the sale and started our foundation uh, devoted to teaching people how to take care of themselves. Paul, in, in 1993, I believe, is, is when you came across Professor Eugene Fama's work on, on market efficiency and what the implications of that are for investors. Can you talk about the impact that Fama's work had on the, the way that you built your firm? Well, I, I will tell any professional who has not been exposed to that work, although today that work is available easily, but it was not available to everybody in 1993. But if you love this business, and you really want to help people, and you go through their, I think it's three-day event uh, that they have academics come in and talk with you and people from the company talking with you, you come away from that three days uh, sky high, ready to change the world and understanding that there truly is, at least based on everything we know about the past, a better way to invest if you have the investor's best interest at heart. And I was so excited about it that, that we immediately uh, tried to have the right to use their funds because in those days, I don't know what it's like today. You have a better idea than I do, I suspect. But in those days, they didn't want, they didn't want all firms to come use their product. They wanted people who were committed to a buy and hold, who were committed to a number of things that would not only benefit the clients, but the, the clients of the advisor, but also benefit other clients of other advisors because it was eliminating the turnover that costs investors money that most mm -hmm. investors don't even know is disappearing because of turnover. So uh, it, it was truly um, uh, a, a life changer, but I'll tell you, leaves about investing it took them almost a year to approve us. They really made us jump through a lot of hoops. Wow, yeah, that's that's interesting. Cameron, I'd be actually just interested if, if can, you, can you speak, Cameron, to the experience? It might be interesting for Paul to hear too. What, what was it like when PWL went through the same process with Dimensional? Well, that's when they first came to Canada back in the fall of 2003. And yeah, we met with uh, the most senior people of the company. They came to do due diligence on us as much as us on them because we were one of the lead firms to start working with them when they came to Canada. We're part of a handful of companies that had asked them to come to Canada. And as they were doing their due diligence, they wanted to come and check us out and see what our processes were and if we were really embracing the philosophy. So it was it was not easy to get in. Interesting. So similar, similar experience to Paul. And remember... I was a market timer. It's interesting you mentioned uh, Jack Bogle. That was one of the questions that our community board had asked us to ask you about was that meeting you had with him, I believe in 2017. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that meeting and did it change any of your views on investing? Well, it, it changed a lot about investing for me. Uh, I, I loved the fact that he he was going to give me an hour in his office. He gave me an hour and a half. Wow. And uh, I had heard he is a little bit on the gruff side, if he wants to be. He was <laughs> as gentle 
and as nice as he could be with the exception of about 30 seconds. And uh, <laughs> uh, what I found was I always thought of Vanguard and, and John Bogle as being my competition because they were preaching a different story and advocating a different combination of asset classes. And I had a hard time understanding what, what part of the academic research did John Bogle not understand? Mm -hmm. And he was very open to talk about it. And it turned out Vanguard was not our competition. We were in a totally different uh, part of the world uh, in terms of the investors that we were serving. But from their world, they wanted everything to be as simple as possible. They wanted it to be as, as uh, acceptable as possible. For example, if we have a portfolio, then it's partly small and partly large, value and growth, et cetera. And, and the S&P 500 is doing great and these other asset classes aren't we have prepared our clients that that is the way it goes. This is the other side of the coin right. when you have broad diversification. He says, our clients can't take that. We need clients who are, are satisfied with being, for example, he was always an S&P 500 guy. He didn't even, when we first had started having him on the radio, he didn't want any international in the portfolio. Wow. He just wanted the S&P 500. Later, gently he starts to add a little uh, international, but, he, but he'll almost always, he would say, but no more than 20% because you just don't need it. And, and he also started advocating for the total market index, which has virtually the same return as the S&P 500 for the last 90 some years. So it wasn't a, a big change. It was still a cap weighted but it means it's cap weighted in companies that the people who are investing at Vanguard know and love probably. And so when they're down, like from 2000 through 2009, when the S&P 500 not only twice loses half of the value of its portfolio, but the compound rate of return is less than 1%. It's a negative 1% a year for that 10 year period. If that had been small cap value uh, at a negative 1% and the S&P 500 compounding at seven or 8% like our accounts did. And if you were around back then, your accounts would have likely have done. It, we would have been gone. We would have been mm -hmm. the devil incarnate because we had you in those things that went down. But when it was the S&P 500 that went down, People said, it's okay. They're great companies. They're here to last. It is simpler and more dependable. And that's what Vanguard wanted for people. He knew DFA. What, I mean, he knew all about DFA. He was a great fan of, of Fama and French. He approved of what they wrote. But he said, that doesn't mean it's right for our investors. Right. Which, by the way, goes over into the target date funds. It's the same thing. They want to treat people not like they're idiots, but like they want to be gentle and make sure that they don't do something to disrupt the, the emotional attachment that they have to that target date fund. It's really interesting. G given that conversation that you had with him, I think that the Vanguard investor, especially now, maybe maybe more so than then, is is very focused on fees and costs, which which uh, without question are important. How how do you think investors should balance that fee frugality with expected returns? Well, there are a couple things I find interesting about the fee discussion with Vanguard investors. They will tell me they want the lowest fees. And I say, okay, why aren't you going to Fidelity? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really want low fees, they have zero fees on some of their funds. But it turns out it's okay if the fees are higher if they're at Vanguard, but otherwise they're not. The, the problem I have with the fee discussion is that if they tell me it's all about fees, then my response is, no, wait a minute, let me understand. If the S&P 500 has a four one hundredths of 1% internal expense ratio, 
are you telling me that if you found a bond fund that had a one one hundredth of one percent, you would think it would be smarter to be in the bond fund? And they go, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Well, because stocks make more than bonds. Oh, so then you have to go further and say, if you believe that there's a premium for small cap over large, which even John Bogle believed that there was in the long term, but sometimes you have to wait a very long term to see it. But if there is, then what you should be doing if you wanna have small cap in your portfolio is you should have the small cap that has the lowest fees. You're not comparing the S&P 500 to a small cap fee because there are different kinds of funds. And it even, I think, Ben, it gets more complex than that. We do a lot of work with small cap value. We recommend the event, uh, Avantis funds. Uh, are they, by the way, in Canada? No, they, yeah, their, their products are not in Canada, but it, as Canadians, it's fairly easy for us to access the Avantis funds. Right. Anyway, the small cap value fund at Vanguard is a very large small cap value fund. And the fund that we recommend is a very small small cap value fund, more heavily discounted too, in terms of the value. And a lot of investors mm -hmm. thought that the that the target date, I mean, the, the small cap value at Vanguard was better because it was making a better return than the one that was a smaller small cap. That's not what it was about. As you guys know, it was because large cap was beating small, growth was beating value. So a larger, more growth oriented, if you want to look at it, is going to likely do better. And it did, but now, that small values coming into vogue, uh, the, the Vanguard fund looks like a dog. It is not a dog. It's just a different asset class. And that's something that a, a lot of folks who are into the small and value are not aware of how delicate those things are even within each style box. Yeah, it's a, that, that's a really good way to think about it on a similar line of thinking, somewhat related anyway, not not exactly the same. But <laughs> how do you think about how do you think investors should think about that trade off between simplicity, like maybe the Vanguard S and P five hundred at the most extreme, and 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 keep keeping I, I think probably do it yourself investors in in mind. So simplicity at the one end with Vanguard versus something more complex with maybe the Avantis and and the, and the more extreme factor exposures built in there. How should investors think about that trade-off between simple and complex? Well, this was where the finger wagging happened in my meeting with John Bogle, because he was critical of our work and our work that made us, I don't, didn't make us famous, but it had a lot of people at least following our 10 fund strategy, which is big and small and value and growth and US and international and REITs and emerging markets. And he said, you can't do that to the do-it-yourself investor. He said, you've got to make it simple or they're not going to stay the course. They're not going to rebalance appropriately. They're, 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 gonna, they're going to see an asset class that is way out of favor and they're going to want to get rid of that because they'd rather have everything going up at one time, which is one of the problems that do-it-yourself investors have. So I do believe, and our foundation is acting like we believe that even though we want people to have some small and some value, and we, we want broader diversification than you're going to be able to get with any single fund, that we still want to keep it simple. So we have developed strategies today that are a hundred times simpler than the old 10 fund strategy, because we now can do with two funds what right. uh, we would otherwise have recommended 10 and, and, and even make the rebalancing dirt, dirt simple uh, for the individual investor. Hmm. That was another question from the community was to compare and contrast the former ultimate buy and hold portfolio, which had, I believe, 10 equity components to the new two fund solution that you're proposing. You know, this is, uh, there, there are two fellows that are working uh, as 
as uh, uh, in our in our at, at the foundation uh, doing the research, uh, Daryl Balls and Chris Pedersen. And these guys have done some amazing, beautiful teaching tools, as well as Chris Pedersen is the one who came up with the two funds for life strategy, the combination of a target date fund and a small cap value. Um, the, um, it amazes me that by putting a four fund strategy together, using a balance of US and international and large and small and value and growth that the return for the last 51 years is virtually the same as the 10 fund strategy. And what it leaves out, uh, REITs and emerging markets. One that's very volatile and, and potentially profitable, the other one less volatile and, and and not expected to have high profitability, but to be more about reducing risk. But virtually the return, the compound rate of return of the four fund strategy is the same as the 10 fund strategy over 51 years. And that makes me ecstatic because that means it is more likely for people to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and because there are fewer moving parts. And the parts are very simple. The S&P 500 is your large cap blend. Don't need large cap blend over in the international because you got it here in the US and generally they go up and down together, not always. The large cap value, you get that internationally. So now you've got your large cap value, your large cap blend. In the international, you do the small cap uh, blend. In the U US, you do the small cap value, which works out beautifully because it's hard to get small cap blend internationally. It's easy to get small cap blend in the US. So those four funds uh, have a track record that is far better than the S&P 500, is about the same as the 12 fund strategy, a little more, a little more, uh, but but it is meant to compete with the S and P and to compete with the ten, and hopefully keep people in the process longer. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's we really have interesting. Dreams. You guys have dreams. I have dreams. You sit down with a a new client and you're talking with them, and I know what that dream is. We want to know who you are, so that we can tell you what we think you should do, and we want you to do it for the next fifty years. Mm -hmm. And you know the problem. The rest of, of, of Wall Street and, and the industry wants them to do something else. And the more complicated that you do, and by the way, the more out of sync with what they expect of you, the harder it is to keep them in the process. It, it drives me nuts because you can't even see your competition. You don't. You can't even stay on top of what they're telling people, but you know intuitively most of what they're getting is not good for them. I, I want to touch on the on the simple versus complex question from a from a slightly different uh, angle. You, you've been you've been working with and providing information to do it yourself investors for years, and including the ten fund portfolio and, and the more complex sliced up portfolios like that. Are, are there any and the reason I'm asking this just for context is that a lot of our listeners are do-it-yourself investors who do have complex portfolios because they really like the evidence and they and they want to they want to optimize. Are are there any are there any costs that people might not think about until it happens uh, to having a more complex portfolio? Like I'm thinking about o mental overhead or errors on implementation. You've touched on some of those, but I'd I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I mean, we know. Um, and if I could recommend one book here uh, today that I think uh, if people really, uh, I've read it probably six times. Uh, you guys have probably read it at least once, and that's Your Money and Your Brain by Jason Zweig. Yep. And the problem is not with, with strategies. Strategies are a dime a dozen. And I mean strategies uh, that are good. The White Coat Investor has a, uh, a piece that he does uh, 200, I think it's 150 strategies or portfolios better than yours. 
And they are just a bunch of portfolios like we would develop or you might develop for a do-it-yourselfer. And they all do okay. And what gets in the way of success in this industry is not the strategies. It's the investor's emotions. And we're, oftentimes we forget, and we should always as advisors, when I was an advisor, I'd always remind myself that when it comes to sex, food, and money, this is not an intellectual decision-making process. It's almost all emotional. Mm -hmm. And how we feel about the results, whether it's sex, food, or money, is also an emotional response. So we might even think, because we picked a stock and it went up, that somehow we're in tune with things and we understand the market. And of course, in most cases, we, we, we don't. I don't understand the market. I've told people for years, I never made a client a penny. The market made our clients money. I did. And so I, I can't take any credit except maybe to keep them on course. And that is the problem because it is so easy for a do-it-yourselfer to get off course. When you have an advisor, this is where they, they, they earn their keep. When you have an advisor, somebody is there to remind you. Now, wait a minute. We had a discussion about the return you needed, about the risk you were willing to take. And now you're coming to me. The market is down 15%, let's say. You said you were willing to lose 30% in order to, to, to meet your long-term objective. And, and now all of a sudden you're changing. We got to talk about this because whatever you do next, and I would always say, you want to go out and do it on your own? go out and do it on your own, but do the right thing. And the minute that they start responding to short-term information, which our industry is so good at making available in order to get people all stirred up, then they're likely to do something bad. In a way, I'm embarrassed, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I have an advisor. I don't do my own work. I, I know how I feel about money. There's things about money that, that, I'm a, that I get worried about and stressful about. I don't want, at 77, I've got enough money. There's no reason for me to be involved in it. There are people who know the taxes, the estate planning and all that stuff. I don't need to do it. I don't want to do it because I would do more harm than good. Hmm. And people are so optimistic about their abilities to do all these things. None of us control the market. And yet we talk about it like we know what's going to happen. Market's going to go, it's overpriced, interest rates are going up. There's, people have been telling me interest rates are going up for a decade. <laughs> and if I'd listened to them, then we wouldn't have done as well as we did on the fixed income part of the portfolio. All right. Now, on that line of thinking, on that line of thinking of thinking we know what's going to happen, uh, I, I, one of the things that comes up within our little podcast community bubble is this idea of, okay, we, we see what the evidence says uh, about small cap value as the, as the example I'm going to use. Why would we not just take that evidence and make the most concentrated possible portfolio out of only small cap value? Forget about the market, forget about everything everything else. And I think that one of your glide path portfolios does something similar to this. Do you think it's sensible or how do you think investors should think about this idea of only owning small cap value? Well, uh, I would guess there are very few people who will stay the course doing that. Uh, I'll, I'll take it just a slightly tilted a little bit uh, and, and, but approach the same all or nothing kind of a decision. I'm working on an article that'll come out in a couple of months about having your money in equities your whole life, all equities, all the time, until you retire and until you die. And what are the implications of that in terms of the trip you're going to be on, the risk you're going to take? If we look backward, which of course is not enough, but there's no, and there's no risk in the past, so we always know what we should have done. So that's always... Um, a question we have about uh, optimizing the past somehow. But I think there's a case that can be made for an all equity portfolio all of your life. I actually know a lot of my friends that have done that. 
I was chicken. I always considered myself an aggressive chicken. I was always afraid. <laughs> I, was, I always thought right around the corner, a catastrophic event is going to happen. And you've worked for people like that, I'm sure. And they're hard clients because their stories they make up in their head about the catastrophe are se seldom come true. They seldom came true in my particular case. But should it be small cap value? Well, I can give you one case where I think it could be, but it's only because in a sense, you want to roll the dice for the big time. Newborn child. I don't know how many kids you guys have, but if, if, if you do something we could do with every newborn child as a parent, if we can afford it, is put away $365 a year. And you put that away until let's say they're 21 and I would put it in small cap value. No question. I'm very comfortable with that because, and there's a study that, have you seen our telltale chart on small cap value versus the S&P 500? No. Well, I'll get back to that in a minute because I think it's an important thing to understand about small cap value. But during that period of time, and I don't know the laws, tax laws in, in Canada, but if that child works when they're 16 years old, you can match that if you want and put it into an IRA or the RSSP or something you have. Yep, that's okay. right. So would I recommend that somebody put away $365 a year, put it into small cap value, transition it into like a, do you have the similar to a Roth IRA in Canada? Yep. TFSA, yeah. I mean, wow, think of that. If you could put away <laughs> 365 for 21 years and Get that over into the Roth product as soon as possible. Just let it go. Just let it be. I started a company in 1983 with $15,000. That's all the money I ever personally put into it in terms of equity. And that company, I let it ride. I, I, that 15000 I could have cashed out along the way and, and made money on the company. But I continued to take the risk until I finally got to the point where I felt it was time to pass the baton of risk to younger people. Even though I knew that I'll never duplicate what I would be able to do with a private company like that. So in a sense, I've done that. I put a little bit of money in, but that wasn't the only money I had invested in the world. But the 15,000 was allowed to grow untouched for 30 years. And I think you could do the same and have every bit as good a company in the long run. If you look at small cap value and what it will do with a turn, I mean, it's going to turn over. There'll be lots of companies you never even heard of that will event. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, small cap value owns or did own, as far as I know, at DFA, a uh, trade stop. GameStop. GameStop. Is that, oh, GameStop. GameStop. Excuse That's me. Right. That's how far I'm out of it. But anyway, <laughs> I own GameStop. <laughs> and, and, and so you don't know what you're going to have in there, but I'll bet you anything of all the little companies that get started in the next 20 years, that that small cap value company you started with 365 a year over 21 years will be one of the best producing companies of all. Is there anything, Paul, that, that could go wrong or, or what? I mean, of course there are things. What do you think could go wrong with an all small cap value strategy? Oh, thank you for, I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about a few minutes ago. Uh, I can make a guarantee. I have a, I only have a few guarantees I know I can make and I don't have to answer to a compliance officer like you do, thank God. I can guarantee that if you follow my advice, you will lose money. I can, uh, I can uh, uh, guarantee that the, well, let me go to the guarantee about small cap value. Uh, I can guarantee you will go a very long period of time uh, with underperformance that is totally unacceptable, but it's the way it really is. And I will send you the telltale chart. You may decide to if you can add it to this, the, whatever you distribute. But here is what it shows. It shows the cumulative return of the S&P 500 versus 
small cap value starting in 1930. And the immediately what happens is small cap value falls out of bed. So does the S&P 500, but not as fast. And so for the early years, you start at the value of one. In the early years, the S&P 500 is ahead. They're both down, but the S&P 500 is doing better. Then the market turns around and you head up. And after, I think, a total of about 13 years, you finally get the small cap value to where its total cumulative value is more than the S&P 500. Then it takes off like a rocket. It does that for about seven years. And then it goes into another holding pattern where you're better off to just have the S&P 500. And that goes maybe for 13 years. And the one we're in, in right now has gone on for about 14 or 15 years. So that's the way it's going to be if the future is going to be like the past. And I trust that that is probably the way it's going to be. How many people are going to be able to stay the course when for 13 years their neighbor is bragging about how much money they're making in the S&P 500? That is what they're going to have to put up with. That is very, very difficult particularly if you're studying the market and you're listening to what people are recommending where big money is going to be made. I think of all the cryptocurrency stuff I read about. How can we deny people win lotteries? If you tell somebody who just won the lottery, that's stupid. That's stupid to put a, you know, buy lottery tickets. Oh yeah. Right. Nerman. They pat me on the head and send me away. <laughs> so, so I think people need to be very realistic. This is why we produce the fine tuning table. It's been doing it for 25 years. And what it shows for the S&P 500, for all cap, all value, for the four funds US, the four funds globally, uh, for all small cap value, we look at the returns from 1970 through 2000 every year how did those strategies do? But not just how did the strategy do, let's put it together with some fixed income. So we look at all bonds, 10% equity, 20% equity, all the way over to 100% equity. So then you get to see what a wild ride all of these different strategies would have gone through. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, at the bottom of the page, we show you the worst three months, the worst six months, the worst 12 months, 36 months, and 60 months, so you'll know it ain't going to be pretty. So you're ready for it. I got criticized for years because I would go back to the 19, late 1920s and show how bad the market was from 29 to 38. And people would say, that's not fair. That's never going to happen again. Well, it did happen again. And when it did happen again, it was actually worse than what happened from 29 to 38. My followers, theoretically, were ready for it. They didn't want it, but it's not like nobody ever warned them that it was that it was it was going to happen. We did warn them, and it did. And that's not good, but it did. What What would you say, Paul, to someone who heard you say this message 14 years ago, and they thought they were ready for the small cap value ride, and now it's 14 years in, and the the premium's not there and it's coming up on year 15 and, and they're thinking that they're going to bail and go back to, to market or large cap or something like that. What would you tell them today? Well, in, in a way, it's not so dissimilar from what Dr. Fama uh, told someone who asked him uh, legitimately. I understand this. You, you, you tell us that small cap has a, is a, has a premium over large cap. And for the last 30 years, it hasn't. And, and, and Fama's uh, response was, well, you're not very patient, are you? This is the problem. This is why massive diversification is the right thing to do. Hide the misery amongst the, the hopeful, positive response of the other asset classes. Because the minute we see some something with too much of our money in it and it's just terrible 
And by the way, just because small cap value doesn't make as much as the S&P 500 doesn't mean it was a bad investment. I, I was in the business and, and fortunately you guys weren't because it was five of the toughest years I ever, I had. And it wasn't during the bad times. It was during the good times. From 1995 to 99, the S&P 500 compounds at 28 and a half percent. My brilliantly built portfolios with the help of the genius of Dr. Fahm and Dr. French compounded at 11. And you can imagine kind of handholding that we had to do to keep people in the process. And I even wrote an article uh, January of 2000 that this is not a new era. Now, how do I know it's not a new era? I didn't know, but I couldn't conclude that it was a new era because if it in fact was a new era and people actually at that point believe the next decade that the return on the S&P 500 compounded would be between 20 and 30%. But where was the evidence that that should happen ever again, maybe for five years? I, 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 didn't, I had no idea, but my, my belief was we're better off in the broadly diversified portfolio. And for the next decade, while the S&P 500 loses money, the more broadly diversified portfolio made money and su sufficient that somebody was, if they were taking money out of the portfolio, would have met the needs they needed if they were taking distributions of three or four or five percent. Yeah, I, I was in the business back then with you, Paul, and your assessment is absolutely accurate. That's exactly our experience that we had. So yeah. you've been educating people about sensible investing for decades. I'm curious what in your mind has been the most difficult message to get across to people? Well, I, uh, I, I think creating reasonable expectations and, and that is because of all the emotional needs that we have. Um, we tried to separate people by getting them to, to tell us what really was important to them. And by the way, I don't know how long you spend with a first time client, but back then I spent an hour to an hour and a half. I needed everything I thought that I needed to know. And they either hired me, I never called them back. I never even, because I was having fun. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to build a business. Um, but the fact is you need to know a lot more than what you learn in an hour to an hour and a half. Now they had spent three to six hours with me in a class. So it's not like they didn't know what I believed. The problem is if you don't understand the innards of people, then it's hard to know how to keep them uh, in line on course. I used to ask something very simple. Is your primary objective, because I, I know I need to help you get that above all, to beat the market, to get the highest return you can within your risk tolerance, or to find the lowest risk way to achieve the rate of return that you need. And if I could get them to identify those that decision, uh, then I could really drill down and make sure that everything that we're focused on is to is about that what they what the primary need is. In some cases, it was just the need for safety. They really didn't want to take any risk at all, but felt they had to. And I even found that when I asked the people who said that their primary objective was to get the highest, to, I'm sorry, to beat the market, I would say, okay, now let me make sure I understand. If the market is down 50 and you're down 40, you did it. And they said, well, no, no, that wasn't talking about wanting to lose 40%. So, so, <laughs> so we would then move those people over into the category. We want to get the highest return we can within your risk tolerance. And that's what they wanted instead of just to beat the market. They understood that they didn't want to lose 40%. So then I would say, okay, then let's figure out how much you're willing to lose. And, uh, and, and of course, they're uncomfortable about that, but that 
in a sense, I'm willing to lose 20% of what I've worked my whole life to save. Well, if that's, if you're asking me to get you the highest return within your risk tolerance, I cannot work for you, you until you tell me how much you're willing to lose. So they would cough up something. Let's say it was they're willing to lose 20%. So now, let me tell you what I've got to do now. My job is, since you want to get the highest return you can, and you're willing to lose 20%, I've got to make sure you lose 20%. Because unless you, unless I take you there, I'm not likely to get you the highest return. Yep. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. I'm not sure that's what I want either, they would say. <laughs> and you work and you work until you, and by the way, many of them were looking for the lowest risk way to get the return they needed for the rest of their life. And that's a totally different portfolio. So, so that I think helped make us a successful investment advisory firm. We really worked hard to understand that client, but where I am now, I'm just a lowly teacher. In fact, as you guys would know, I can't even give investment advice. I can entertain. I can cajole, I can, I can suggest. I will tell people who demand they talk to me, all right, maybe for a couple of minutes and I'll give you a nudge in the right direction. But I can't be your advisor. No. How do you do, how does, how do, does anybody who's doing a, an article, writes articles, does podcasts, and we even go so far as to recommend the right funds at Vanguard and Fidelity and Schwab and the best in class ETFs, we do a ton of stuff, but we can't get involved in the decision you personally make. And that's tough because we can't, without being able to get those answers, I can't give good advice. You guys can. And that's the difference between following some online personality and actually having somebody understand your inner feelings. And by the way, as you guys also know, in many cases, the inner feelings you never get in the relationship between a teacher and the student is the student is married to somebody who has an entirely different set of, of needs and desires and risk tolerance, which you guys are going to drill down into. And I haven't got a chance to do that. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the reason the expectations are, I mean, it's hard for me to help people establish realistic expectations unless I really know them. You, you implicitly answered the question that I'm going to ask next, but I, I still do want to ask the question. And you, you've mentioned a couple of different things that answered this question throughout our conversation. One, one earlier, you said that we give all this information away for free, but a lot of people just don't want to do it themselves. And then just now you were talking about that, that relationship and having someone that fully understands your situation and where you want to go being able to give you advice. So the question that I want to ask explicitly now is given that we're providing all of this information for free to help people make their own good decisions, where do you see or how do you explain the primary value of financial advice, of working with a with someone like us or like what you used to be? Well, I think, first of all, the advisor can ask questions. And if you go in to uh, an advisor and they spend the first hour talking about how great they are. That's not an advisor for you. You want somebody who spends most of their time asking about who you are. And, and so I think that is, it is key. Now, as far as this education, I have got to believe that you believe in absolute Full disclosure, tell the truth, don't hide the warts. There are warts. You have them, I have them, the industry has them. And 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 because I think when I see your your uh, YouTube pieces you do, Ben, uh, you're standing up so straight and you're so serious, and they have those <laughs> nice uh, 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 cartoon or graphics. I just think you do. A, a fantastic job and when i watch you're getting the information i want to i want i would say like to say the same thing as you say but you say it better than i can say it or you read it better than i can read it i have no idea which it is but i 
I really respect what you're doing. When you educate people, you hopefully get a customer, when they become a customer, who now understands the process and are less likely to hurt themselves because you have educated them. Wall Street does not want to educate you. The kids that go to my high school class that I teach, they're going to learn about index funds. They're going to they're, they're going to learn about not trusting Wall Street, by the way, because I don't think Wall Street has their best interest at heart. And so the kind of teaching and do-it-yourself work that you're doing, I think it's for, from how I feel about it, what I believe in, it's perfect. And here's the bonus that I'm sure you have felt. Do-it-yourselfers are oftentimes amongst friends, the go-to person, the person who they know is spending time going to workshops online that they'll never do that. And so, well, what do you think I should do, Joe? Well, I think you should go listen to Ben or go listen to Cameron because they're the ones that knows what that know what's going on. And you know something? I just don't think that they may not be this honest that you're going to do this very well on your on your own. And so you get a referral and the best referral that you can, a referral from somebody who other people think really understands the market. So the payoff, I just think the payoff for a business like you guys are building, um, it's, it's just huge because it's not just the payoff for you, it's the payoff for the investor. Everybody in our industry that I've ever talked with believes the key to success for the long term for an investor is getting on course and staying on course and don't be somehow thrown off course. And of course, the first thing they all try to do is to get that client away from somebody else and get them off course long enough to come over to their course. That's the problem. And I, plus, I will tell you who I think like your work at least if, if it's anything like the work that we do in, in terms of how it impacts people, it's going to impact people who care about getting an education. And the group that are most likely going to be getting that education are engineers and other people who understand numbers, understand the rule of 72 maybe. And, 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 and so they, once you, once you can convince an engineer that you've got the right way and they're not a do-it-yourselfer, it can take five or six years for an engineer to make a decision because they like to study it for a long time. But once you get them as a client, it's almost impossible to lose them because they're so committed to the education. I think it's a big deal. We, we, agree, we agree, definitely. Uh, speaking of a big deal, Paul, this past December, your latest book was released called We Are Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. And I must say, it, it is an excellent book. It's, a, it's an easy read. It gets the point across effectively. And it's a fun read, quite frankly. Uh, it, the book starts out where you talk about small steps with big payoffs. Can you talk about some of the habits that you recommend individual investors practice? Um, yes, I'm happy to. And, and, and let me, that, that we're talking millions. I want to make sure that your listeners and viewers understand, I really mean millions. And I don't mean 1 million. I mean, each of those 12 steps is potentially a million dollar payoff. And it's easy to make the case for each one of them as far as I'm concerned. And it is about habits and it is about beliefs. The habits, if we want to think in terms of what is the most important habit, is the habit of saving. Because that starts the whole process. Without it, you get nowhere unless you inherit it. And so what does that habit mean? Well, first of all, I, I do think that one of the, our best educators in terms of good quotes is Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett says that you, you don't save what's left over after spending, you spend what's left over after saving. And that is something that almost everybody that I have seen has been successful as a young investor. They've come to that commitment that they must give up spending 
And then I rush in and say, you are not giving up spending. You are putting money away to spend later. This is not about, you know, Scrooge McDuck jumping around in a pile of money. This is about having the money to spend later. It's still spending. And I, th and I, it's those times, types of habits, dollar cost averaging. What an amazing habit that we all know is likely to lead to greater returns than almost any other habit an investor ha might have about putting money aside because it guarantees that you buy more shares when the price is down and fewer shares when the price is up. And uh, it overcomes one of the biggest reasons people don't want to invest. And that is they don't want to invest because they think the market's going to go down. Wait a minute. That's what you want when you're dollar cost averaging and you're young. You want the market to go down. I know that's counterintuitive to young people, but it's a time to celebrate, not, not, not for sadness. Your parents and your grandparents, you can be sad for them, but you should be happy with a bear market. And maybe that will help people get in and do this stuff right. And another habit, I'll call it a habit, even though I totally believe in market timing, I believe that maybe one out of a hundred investors, maybe it's only one out of a thousand investors should use market timing because one way to lose half of what you make over a lifetime on your investments is to make one wrong market timing decision. And people don't make market timing decisions with, with automated systems or systematic uh, formulas. No, they use what I call the ICSIA strategy. That's the I can't stand it anymore. And that's what happened to investors in the spring of 2008. They got out. And you talk to them, people still today trying to figure out, how do I get back in? Well, we can figure out a way to get you back in, of course. But in the meantime, you've just lost half, of, at least half of what you would have had in retirement had you just stayed the course. And that means a habit or a commitment to being truly a buy and holder. But the other side of that formula about those those. 12 decisions. Every time I can find a way to add a half of 1% to your return, that's all I want is a half of 1%. For somebody in their 20s, maybe even in, it means an extra million to a million and a half dollars over their lifetime. An extra half a percent. Could we get a half a half a percent by investing in mutual funds with lower expenses? Yes. Could we have a pick up a half a percent in taxes if we if we took the right tax steps? Yes. Could we make an extra half a percent if we added some value to our portfolio? Yes. How about small cap? Yes. And then the one that just blows me away is the target date fund. Forget about the fact that I want people to add 10% to their target date fund in small cap value or use the magic formula that Chris Pedersen created to, to, to make a lot more with your target date fund. But even if you just invest in the target date fund, according to a study, here's those academics at work again, they looked at 1.2 million accounts at Vanguard. These were all 401k accounts. Some of those people had all their money in target date funds. Some of those people didn't have any of their money in target date funds because they knew better. They had a sense for what they should do with their money that was better than what the professionals would have done with it. The difference in return for 13 years was 2.3% a year. 2.3% a year. Well, if a half a percent can, can be converted into an extra million or a million and a half, 2.3%, you know, that is earlier retirement. That is more money to spend in retirement. That is more money to leave to your kids and your, your charities. And you didn't have to know anything to get it. You didn't have to do anything. You only had to decide, and, and I don't know that you have target date funds in, 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 in Canada. So I may be talking about a subject that is, it doesn't matter, but 
but it, it just shows how letting somebody else do it can make a really big difference. Yeah, that, that's staggering data. We, we, the, the more commonly accessible product in Canada right now are, are fixed allocation funds, but it's the same kind of idea where it's a fixed allocation that you don't do anything to. You've mentioned your passion for education a couple of times, Paul. You, you talked about how how well it can serve a business, which which we agree with, and that's one of the reasons that we also engage in all the educational work that we do. But now you're in a position where you've got to focus on education without without the the business on the other side of it. Can you talk about what you're trying to accomplish with the Merriman Education Foundation? Well, the the first thing is I want to bring to people the kind of information that I brought to the people that we ended up working for for many years. Uh, I want to bring it with zero conflicts of interest. When I sold the business, I could have retained ownership. Uh, I'm sure they would have been happy if I retained ownership because then people would know he owns part of that company. That'd be a place to do some business. Uh, I didn't. I didn't want any conflict of interest. And when I started the foundation under the bylaws, I'm not allowed to take any income, nothing. Chris Pedersen, Daryl Balls, nothing. These folks are, it's all volunteer work. Hmm. And it's and if for people who know our work, that, that the work they've done, I can't take credit for it. I'm there for the conversations and I love the conversations. But the bottom line is I want to be conflict of interest free. The only person I want to serve is the, the investor, the individual investor. By the way, it may be that somebody gets an education following our, edu our work and it makes them a better client for an advisor or they'd be better served to, uh, to uh, uh, determine whether an advisor is appropriate for them. I've got a book entitled uh, Get Smart or Get Screwed. Uh, how to select the best and get the most out of your investment advisor. So uh, I do think that our job is to help everybody understand so they can make better decisions. And we do it from birth to death. We, 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 I think we may be the only one that in fact uh, is, is devoted to all stages of life. So when that baby is born, we want the parents and the grandparents parents to jump on them and get them investing as soon as possible. And for people who are in retirement, we have all sorts of information to help them know how much do I need to retire? How much can I take out? So we show them fixed and variable. We show them 3% distribution, four, five, and six, all these, so they can make these huge decisions. And, and I think our, our responsibility is pretty simple. One is we want to help people identify the best equity asset classes. You've already done that. We want people to know from an overview uh, viewpoint, what, how much should be in each one of those equity asset classes. So we have portfolios. Then we want you to know how much you should have in fixed income. So we have tables that show you those portfolios with fixed income. Then we want you to be able to know how much you can take out in retirement. And we show you all of those tables. I think we have 150 tables in total on the site. And then finally, and we really haven't done this one as well as we're going to, we need to deal with the glide path. The target date fund has a glide path. Why shouldn't every first time investor have a glide path? And uh, I don't know, for example, I am curious, uh, in, in your work, when you're setting up a new account, is part of that process that you develop uh, a glide path for 10 years or 20 years or for a lifetime? How do you handle that? At the moment, we don't do that. And actually, there was some research that came out of somebody else within our firm, uh, PWL Capital, showing that the, the target date glide path is actually suboptimal relative to picking a fixed allocation. Yes, yes, I totally agree with that. Starting with the idea that anybody would put 10% fixed income in a 21-year-old's portfolio. In fact, I wagged my finger at John Bogle when I, <laughs> when I had that conversation because I said, how can you do that to a young person? Every 10% more in equities 
leads to a half a percent return. There's another half percent, just 10% more. The answer is revealing. We are not running target date funds to build great wealth. We are building these for people to have enough. He even wrote a book entitled Enough. Right. Okay? He said that the reason that 10% is there is to have them understand that over the next 40 year, whatever number of years, we're going to be adjusting this, mm -hmm. this fixed income in your portfolio. Now, what they could have said, they could have said, but we want you to understand, you should not be defensive right now. In fact, if you were defensive with a little bit of fixed income, it means you're not going to buy as much of the equities that are down when they're down. So it's the con that's actually contradictory to what is in your best interest. But they decided as an organization, it is better to educate people that bonds are part of this process and that we're here to serve you for a lifetime. And all we're suggesting, by the way, is okay, John, but just take 10% and put it into small cap value. Put 90% into the target date fund, 10% into small cap value, probably add a half of 1%. Right. Uh, forgive me, Paul, while I reminisce, and my kids always roll their eyes when I reminisce, but I can remember back, I'm sure it was the late 90s, early 2000s, where I discovered your website. And I was like, oh my God, you and your colleague at the time, Tom Cock, had this radio program long before podcasting was a thing. And I would tune in, I think every Saturday, uh, I would listen to your most recent episode and say, oh my gosh, there's people that are doing the exact same thing that we are, you know, across North America. And I used to just love listening to it. Now, you were clearly ahead of your time. Can you talk about the impact you had, what it was like in that era? Because it was a unique thing that you were doing. It couldn't be any more fun. That's the reality of it, Cameron. It was just a blast. And Tom Cock who now has his own investment advisory firm, uh, has done very well. He, he left us uh, some years ago. In fact, I was very supportive of him starting his own investment advisory firm. Um, but he came, to, he came to our firm and he was working at a radio station and he wanted to sell me advertising. And see, one of the reasons I don't want to manage my own money is I'm a sucker for a sales pitch. And Tom got me. And we became friends, and he is now one of my dearest friends. And he's almost like a, a son to me, even though he's not a whole lot younger than I am. But, but I, I do I, I just think he's a great guy. He got me into the radio business. He got me into podcasts. We were rated the number one money podcast by Money Magazine in 2008. And there weren't that many podcasts mm -hmm. around. But it wasn't me that made it fun. I was the numbers guy. I was the guy with the answers to the investment problems. Tom was the, was the one who really made the program interesting and fun. And then Don McDonald joined us. That's and right. Don McDonald had a radio show uh, nationally before we had a radio show. And so uh, Don and Tom have gone on very successful. They're teaching like you guys are. They're teaching like we did. Uh, and, and so I'm really thrilled for them. But I look back, and this is true of every person. When I talk to young people, I make the point that we cannot tell what person we meet today that is going to change our future in a significant way. So we never know. And my mother always said, be nice to everybody you meet in life because they may be the one that changes your life in a way that you can't anticipate. And they did. And by the way, John Bogle did it for you and John Bogle did it for me. True. Because we all serve the thinking that John Bogle, and, and I think we should not forget John Bogle, his success was largely due to luck. And his luck was he starts a mutual fund that nobody believed in. I mean, hardly. They, they, they were going to try to raise $150 million in that original offering. Uh, Dean Witter was the, uh, made the offering. 
and they raised $11 million. The trustees almost decided to close it down. And they were allowed to continue. And for the next 25 years, actually starting in 1975, the S&P 500 compounds at 17.2%. How much intelligence does that take if what your portfolio does is emulate that index? Had he started that at the beginning of 2000, now he could claim a 6% compound rate of return. And he wouldn't have been as famous, I suspect. Luck is a big deal with investing. When we are born is a big deal. Who our parents are is a big deal. And how we treat others. Paul, in, in your years as an educator, but also as a wealth manager, having those deep relationships with clients that you've talked about, and then also your own lived experience. I, I didn't know until until today that when you started your firm, you were already financially independent. So that, that alone is fascinating and makes your perspective on the question I want to ask even more, even more interesting. What have you learned throughout your life about the relationship between money and a life well lived? Well, that's a, that's, that's a tough one. I, um, I'll be as straight as I can uh, without exposing too many of my flaws. Uh, I was raised in a household where it wasn't particularly safe. Um, I had a father who I was totally afraid of. Uh, I hated. I mean, I was a kid feeling hate. That was not an adult feeling hate. Well, I thought it was going to kill me. He never did uh, and probably never intended to. But it felt like it was in his on his mind. And it turned out he was my stepfather. And uh, I was probably a kind of an inconvenience for him in his life with my mother, who was absolutely amazing. Um, but and I, I, by the way, I was very happy to find out he wasn't my father because it explained everything. <laughs> but but the. But what came out of that with money was I did not trust um, my life. And I, I started thinking that money was the salvation that would protect me from all things uh, evil in my life at a fairly young age. And I also, because of not wanting to be at home, found it um, most enjoyable to do other things in the world rather than be at home. So I joined everything that I could join just because every one of those things required me to do something out of the house. But I will tell you that money itself drove me for a long time. And, and I'm not sure that was really helpful for my personal life. Uh, I think it caused me to be a terrible workaholic. Now, my wife would say that I am still a workaholic as I get up at three to four in the morning and and break for lunch with her and then break for dinner. Uh, she knows I love what I'm doing. She, she supports what I'm doing. There's a lot that we do beyond just doing podcasts and writing articles. And, and um, but it took a long time for, for me to get to the point where uh, I was at peace over my money. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, I was always afraid. I was always afraid of the bad thing that was happened would happen when I went around the next corner. That made me a very conservative investor, personally. Hmm. Uh, it also made me a pretty conservative advisor, which probably wasn't all bad. Uh, but it might have been good for my clients if I had been a little more aggressive in hindsight. But you know, it, it, it was what it was. But I can tell you now that I feel like I have everything together in terms of, of money and freedom. Uh, I'm a great believer in working, if you can and if you like it, beyond having enough. I purposefully worked until I had, uh, let's say, more than twice what I really needed I don't live a high life. No, I live a high enough life. I'm not complaining, but but it's it's not uh, the life of, of a rich man. I, I I still consider myself 
to be frugal. But I, we, the first day of each year, the business day, we take out 5% of the portfolio. And that's what we get to spend for that year and, and give. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm totally at peace with that. I have no fear of running out of money before I run out of life. One of the problems, and you know this too from looking at people's situations, when you retire too soon and you really don't have enough except to meet the basics, if the world goes against you, then you can be put in a tough spot, not because you weren't a good saver, not because you weren't a good investor, but something totally unexpected happened. Would that pandemic be an example? I didn't have that in my business plan or my investment plan or anything. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things. And, and so here I am held together by the medical profession in the United States. I'd probably be in better health in Canada, but that's another, that's another discussion. But, but, but the bottom line is that um, I'm, I have the good fortune of being able to afford good health care, uh, live in a good place, have an amazing wife, have grandchildren. None of them uh, have had a bout with the uh, COVID-19. Uh, how blessed can I be? And then at the end of the day, I get to change people's lives. And I mean, in a big way, I got on the phone with a 30 year old kid, starting with $40, got him to Schwab, got him to open a minimum size account, which is zero at Schwab. He is off and running. He read he read the book, the, 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 the We're Talking Millions. He read the book. In fact, he just finished the book before I got on the phone with him. And, uh, and that's going to change his life. And I got to tell you, if somebody goes to the reviews at We're Talking Millions at Amazon, what people have written, there's one four-star review. The rest are five. And the things that people say about that book and they also say about Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls and Rich Buck, other people who have worked with me. It's, it just makes me feel like I am not just financially set, but I psychically have so much income right now. Sometimes I don't know what to do with it because it just feels great. And I sense the path you two are on. You're going to do something. So I really do think this you'll do something similar like this after you've made more money. And let me tell you, it is so much fun not to have to answer to compliance. I mentioned that earlier. <laughs> now, compliance, they used to listen to every one of our radio shows before it could go on the air Yep. and, and take out stuff. And I've always felt like I've always told the truth, but if I couldn't justify and I couldn't prove that didn't have the evidence, sorry, Mr. Merriman. And that was somebody who worked for me was telling me what to do. But that's what they're allowed to do. Anyway, you guys are great. I really do appreciate uh, what you're doing. And I'm always here to help in any way that I can. And I, and I, and I mean that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Paul. And thanks for sharing that, that, uh, that story. One last quick question for you, which we have to ask. As someone who's had a great life, great career, and clearly you're not letting up anytime soon, we're really curious how you define success. Well, I have a whole bunch of friends who I think are very successful. And when I was in the business, I had a lot of clients who were, who, who are very successful. I have old clients in their nineties that call and talk to me once or twice a year and boy are they doing well and it's not about uh, not about about money um i think success is a lot about friends i think we all agree that having a minimal amount of money there is some amount it's gone up over the years i think they now say that you need ninety five thousand dollars a year and beyond that you don't add any more happiness to your life but I believed uh, uh, when I was a kid and when I was trying to get out of the house, one of the places I ended up was in a church, the Episcopal Church in Wenatchee, Washington. And, uh, uh, 
and I think what came out of that time was that there's this responsibility to do good. And so a lot of my friends who are successful find their fun and their success in life playing golf and traveling and doing a lot of things that are not necessarily what ring my bell. What rings my bell is helping people somehow improve their lives. I cannot fix anything in our house. I have to pay somebody to do everything but light bulbs. Uh, I am uh, I am good for one thing, and that is, I think, to share investment knowledge with other people. So I'm going to work that to death until I do die. I have a hunch that might have been true in many cases about John Bogle. I found it interesting in talking with him that never once did he talk about what Vanguard does for rich people. He talked only about what Vanguard did for people who, without help, would, would, would probably not have enough. And so um, I really feel blessed that I have the knowledge that I can share with others that makes me feel like I'm still adding some value. And so even coming on, this is really a big thing to me to be able to talk to new people that I haven't ever talked to before. Well, Paul, this has been been great to meet you to learn more about your story. And again, I thank you for all your work over the years. It's had an impact on us. And this has been a great time with you. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. And thank you, Ben. Thank you, Paul. This was fantastic. I'm counting on you. They're going to keep coming. Don't you worry. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Good luck, you guys. Thank you very right, much. Paul. Thanks.